think while we're gathering cards, I have one question here. Uh, with the news that the U.S. might be considering a cargo tax on goods from BC ports, are you concerned about protectionism in the U.S.? Yes. <laughs> well, not, not only that, I mean, you may or may not have noticed that uh, President Obama, uh, uh, I think about 10, maybe two weeks ago now, uh, announced uh, uh, another round of stimulus spending. I think it was just over half a trillion dollars. Uh, and he is also uh, on that place uh, by U.S. criteria. So it just reinforces the importance to me of uh, being in the Asian marketplace, and particularly China, India, and Korea, uh, because uh, the Americans are continuing to contract and continue to be more protectionist. I see no sign that that will change anytime soon. We've got a couple more questions here. We understand that a larger amount of the raw materials are being shipped to the outside of Canada. Is there a concern that a greater amount of work is being done outside the country rather than inside of the country? This, this kind of falls in the category of uh, what I was referring to statistically earlier on, that if you just kind of listen to the general media, you would believe that uh, the world was ending as we know it today and there was no hope for the future. Uh, we have made a very concerted effort uh, in China in particular to stay focused on shipping manufactured products specifically as it relates to the forest industry as opposed to roundwood. And while there has been lots of public chat about uh, uh, this notion that somehow roundwood exports uh, have become exponentially larger, I was just looking at the statistic uh, the other day for it, and currently year to date, 91% uh, of the value of our shipments into China are manufactured. Uh, forest products, not roundwood, and about 9% is logs. I'm not particularly happy with the fact that 9% is logs. I think it should be lower than that. Uh, but compare that to Washington and Oregon, where about 60% is roundwood and about 40% is manufactured products, or New Zealand, where 100% is roundwood and 0% is manufactured products. We're still pretty well positioned. So we're going to stay focused on that. It's an important issue for, for all of us. Uh, but uh, I think we can be uh, pretty proud of, of uh, the stance that we've taken so far now. We have one more here. What are some of the lessons learned from the success of the BC forest industry that we can, can both be applied uh, in the areas of mining and other industries? Um, I think... Uh, I think two key things. First of all, mining will be different because it's probably about uh, uh, inbound investment, so uh, FDI, um, as opposed to forestry, which was about selling our product to a new market. So it, it was a, it's a different tactic that needs to take place. Uh, but uh, in terms of how do we replicate the experience that we have with forestry to other sectors, and actually use international education, because I think that's a, an appropriate one. I think it's a good model. Uh, the first uh, uh, key thing that we need to understand is that China and India are way too big for any one company or any one post-secondary institution to market themselves in. I, I often like to ask this question uh, in a room of uh, intelligent, articulate people like I'm in today. Uh, how many people can name me three provinces in China? John, Can, Colin, Can. Jenny can. How many can name two? How about one? So what makes us think that they should know where British Columbia is? When you're in a country of 1.3 billion people. I'll tell you what they do know. They do know Vancouver, and they do know Canada. But British Columbia is not something that people acknowledge or understand. So what we did uh, in forestry when we went over there is understood that we are a relatively small player on the world stage and that we needed to somehow lever up the things that people acknowledge uh, in, a, in a different way. So the heads of our five major forest products companies decided that rather than marketing each of their individual companies into China and try to move product in that way, they would do it under one umbrella. And we call it BC SPFA. So BC Spruce Pine Furring. So, we had West Razor, Canfor, Tolco, Interfor, and Western Forest Products all come under one umbrella. And when we went to China, the five CEOs and I would go in and meet with the senior officials and leaders and builders and businesses 
that were uh, looking to import lumber or expand the construction opportunities as it related to, to lumber. And it was an impressive site to see us all coming in with a very targeted focus. Uh, so the first thing we've got to do is get people to realize that they're not competing with each other, they're competing to develop a new market, lesson number one. Lesson number two, you have to invest and invest heavily. You've got to be the biggest son of a in the valley. You can't afford to go in and dabble at something and pretend that you're taking it seriously. In the last uh, uh, three or four years, we've had 52 full-time staff in China paid for 70% by the province of British Columbia, 25% by the federal government, 5% by industry, working to develop that market. 52 people working on one cause selling lumber into China. We've been spending an average of $15 million per year between our various partner groups and ourselves in China for the last three years. But look at the results that have been accomplished. This year will be a billion four in sales into China from a few hundred million a few years ago. So you've got to be big, you've got to be forceful, you've got to be consistent, and instead of competing with each other, you need to understand that we're there to develop a new market and a new market opportunity. So I would say those are the two key things, and if you think about international education and how we might do that, I think it pretty quickly draws you to the conclusion of what our international education strategy will look like.